Thank you for joining us today for our Mather check-in. Today we're joined by Dr. Bruce Farber and led by our president, Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts, if you'd like to go ahead and uh, introduce us, go right ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Emily. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, and happy to announce that we have Dr. Uh, Bruce Farber, who is the uh, Chief of Infection Diseases at all of Northwell. He also has a new title, the Chief Public Health and Epidemiology Officer. Um, everybody has been listening to Dr. Farber's excellent presentations for the last month and a half or two months uh, on uh, Tuesday night. And he is a, a true expert and a great teacher. Uh, and he's here today to uh, answer anybody's questions. I've specifically asked him to talk to the people who have not uh, gotten vaccinated or who are putting it off or who or have even declined it. Uh, maybe because you have uh, questions about family planning, planning a family, uh, or um, you're, you're pregnant, or you have, you're breastfeeding, or you have fertility questions, or you've had reactions in the past uh, to some environmental issues uh, because of uh, some kind of uh, um, uh, bee, bee sting or the like. Uh, so I've asked him to um, make uh, uh, answer any questions that you might have, with obviously with the thought that we would like to have everybody vaccinated because we really think that it's the right thing to do. Uh, so at this point in time, um, I'm very happy and pleased to uh, introduce Dr. Farber. Thank you, Mr. Roberts, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk to you. Uh, I'm just going to say a couple of words and then we will have a question and answer session. Um, as you know, COVID is rounding closer to 300, uh, 400,000 deaths in the United States. It's rampant and totally uncontrolled in virtually every state. Um, and um, there does not seem to be a quick end in sight. On top of that, there's no question that the British B B117 strain is circulating in New York, and in my opinion, will likely become the dominant strain over the next three to four months worldwide. That is certainly what happened with the last big mutation of the 614 mutant that occurred uh, in the late spring. The vaccine, um, I am an unapologetic advocate for vaccinations. The two vaccines that are available to us now are in high demand. We are at least fortunate as healthcare workers to have access to it. As you know, many of you are family members, people over the age of 65, and now immunosuppressed as of this morning are eligible, but are having an incredibly difficult time getting it. It looks like it'll probably take at least two to three months at the minimum until most of the eligible people will have an opportunity to get the vaccine. There are two, there's Moderna and Pfizer. I'm sure you know that. To me, they're both messenger RNA vaccines. They're pretty much identical in terms of their platform and their equivalency. They're very well tolerated in terms of long-term problems. The short-term problems I'm sure you're familiar with, they're very reactogenic, which means that arm pain, low-grade fever, malaise, muscle aches occur more frequently with the second dose than with the first dose but are not severe and usually treated with just Tylenol and Motrin, you can continue to work. We've been surprised that very few people have needed to go home even for a day after the vaccine. The record on safety is as follows. Over 10 million people have now been vaccinated with one or two of these vaccines. And the safety profile has been remarkably good. In the past, uh, after you get to a 3 million mark, any really rare safety problems with a vaccine usually become evident. And so far, then we have not really seen that. Yes, we see a lot of local reactions, but we don't see severe side effects that have not been discovered in the first 9 million people um, vaccinated. Regarding potential problems, it hasn't been studied in immunosuppressed people, but we're pushing it hard in them because they are more vulnerable and have a ad more adverse outcome. Uh, pregnancy, um, as you know, the American College of Gynecology and Obstetrics, as well as the Society for Fetal Medicine, have given their approval to the use of the COVID vaccine in pregnant women and breastfeeding women. I personally and my own family have advocated and got a very close relative who's pregnant to get this vaccine. Why? Because COVID has a worse outcome in pregnancy, particularly in the late third trimester, where the, there's a higher rate of need for hospitalization, ventilation, and death not to mention the incredible problems that it creates when a pregnant woman at the end of her pregnancy delivers with COVID and the, the problems related to 
um, quarantine and separation and the like and visitation become much more difficult and um, problematic for the family. So for all those reasons, I do think it is um, reasonable to give this vaccine in pregnancy. No, it has not been tested in pregnancy. I don't see that ever happening in the foreseeable future. There's not enough pregnant women to, that are gathered in one place to undergo a double bond trial at the present time. So this is probably all the information you will have for some period of time. Um, other serious side effects have never been shown to be cause and effect. Yes, I know there's a doctor in Florida who died of ITP. I hear about occasional cases of Bell's palsy, but I think we're all, you know, skeptical because when you give a vaccine to 9 million people, there's going to be car accidents, there's going to be strokes, heart attacks, and other problems that develop but are not necessarily causally related. Um, so I guess with that introduction, I can stop. The biggest problem we're having with vaccinations now, which I think you're probably aware of, is that the system is overwhelmed, quite frankly. People can't get appointments, they can't get the vaccine, they can't get people to answer their um, the 800 lines, and particularly the elderly who are not very internet sa savvy are having an even more difficult time. So I guess that's uh, my introduction. Just ask me anything you want. Emily, do you wanna read the questions? Yeah, that'd be great. Our first question, will we be able to make appointments for spouses who are eligible uh, groups through Northwell? Not at the present, well, if they're eligible, not with special preference, let's put it that way. We've wanted that, but the system cannot um, handle it. So you can make an appointment for a spouse or relative on the regular county, city, uh, state websites or Northwell websites, but um, it's an independent interaction. Any plans for Northwell to offer vaccinations to eligible employee family members? I think that's the same question. Yeah, I, I think it's been discussed and everyone would love to do it. I'd love to do it for a lot of reasons, not only because it's a good thing to do and it's a nice thing to do, but also because it would be nice to have that family pod secured, if you will, from getting COVID, which would help the hospital and the employer too. Unfortunately, there is just not enough vaccine to make that offer at the present time. And there are some requirements, a certain number of doses have to go to certain communities where there are um, higher rates of COVID and there are um, equity issues, particularly with this vaccine, which you know I, I have said in public and I'll say again, it's become like a lottery for people to get it in the community more than it is who is um, entitled to it and they can make an appointment. The vaccine that we have now, will it work for the new strain? Seeing that all of this is new, meaning the vaccine, how do we know what the long-term effects might be? So there's two questions there. Um, as of now, it looks like it will work for the new strain. There is one strain that has not been circulated yet that may be slightly less inhibited by the vaccine. I suspect that a year, two years, three years, I don't know, that that vaccine will need to be tweaked. And I doubt that this will be the last two vaccines you get for COVID in your life. I also don't think COVID is ever gonna go away. I think we're gonna learn to manage it. Somewhat similar to flu, but obviously it's more severe, but as herd immunity develops, it will, it will calm down and we'll get to some reasonable normal, normalcy. But I think that you know mutations down the line may well make it uh, imperative to change the vaccine. There is concern among young women about the vaccine affecting their fertility. Can you speak to this? Yeah, we talked about this uh, and I've talked about this to our fertility specialists. There's some literature and you know, you have to sort of view this as, is it biologically plausible? Because there are no studies in infertility centers about you know, the COVID vaccine, but everyone who I have talked to makes the point that it makes absolutely no sense who knows things about fertility to think that a messenger RNA vaccine would have any effect on fertility. It would be unprecedented. So I don't think that. I think COVID will have a significant effect on fertility. It's gonna hold up attempts, it holds up in vitro and it causes fatigue and problems down the line. So um, I have no problems um, in answering that fertility question, although I certainly don't have data because none exists. Is there any data on how many months the vaccine will last? 
there's some early data that suggests that eight months is at least um, present. We don't have data far out enough because the vaccine has not been go around that long. So we all hope it's a year or two or more, but I know that it's at least eight months as of now. And each month that clicks by, it seems to be getting longer. Is it safe if you have a sulfa allergy? Yes, it's safe if you have medication allergies, if you have nut allergies, if you have bee sting allergies. You have to be careful if you've had a prior episode of anaphylaxis. And if you have had that, then you just need to be observed for 30 minutes, not for 15 minutes. You still can get the vaccine. The only absolute contraindication to the vaccine is one, any injection for the last two weeks, that's a vaccine. So if you got a DPT because you had just delivered a baby, you can't get the vaccine for two weeks. Secondly, if you got monoclonal antibody because you were sick with COVID. Um, and thirdly, if you've had an anaphylactic reaction to a known component of the vaccine, which is basically either the first vaccine, if you got it, or PEG, polyethylene glycol or polysorbate, which are trace elements in the vaccine. Um, very few, if any, people know that they are allergic to PEG or polysorbate because no one knows uh, what it is, quite frankly. It is in a lot of over-the-counter and, and medications. It's in colonoscopy preps. It's in laxatives, at least the polysorbate is. Um, but those are the only direct contraindications to getting the vaccine. Any thoughts about mobile vans to vaccinate the community? Yes, they've been talked about in detail, particularly for communities where it's difficult for people to turn out. And they certainly are needed in long-term care residents that were not covered by the federal program. Other areas um, like assisted living where people are having a hard time getting the vaccine. Um, once again, all these things I think will come to fruition, but not right away because no one's giving anyone enough vaccine to start doing these programs. In the future, will there be testing for antibodies after receiving both doses of the vaccine? The current antibodies don't reflect immunity that you can test for. So I urge people not to run out and get antibody testing after they've gotten the vaccine. Think of it like varicella, think of it like measles. If you get uh, an MMR, consider yourself immune. Same with uh, the varicella vaccine. The antibodies that are present um, or not present do not reflect the lack of immunity when it comes to these things. So down the line, there may be additional tests that look for how long lasting this immunity is, but at the present time, you can't use serology as a surrogate for who's immune and not immune. Is there any from evidence- the vaccine. I'm oh, sorry. That's okay. Is there any evidence that a child will get antibodies from a breastfeeding mother? Yeah, it's not, they're not gonna get them. Um, again, there's so trivial, trivial amounts of messenger RNA that I don't think anyone thinks that they're immunizing a child uh, with uh, breast milk who is either had COVID or gotten the vaccine. I just don't think it's gonna make any difference. Any info about vaccinating pediatrics? Can't do it. I mean, 16 and 18 are the two age ranges with the uh, Pfizer and Moderna um, at the present time. Uh, trials have started with the Pfizer vaccine for 14 and up but there are no trials in pediatric patients that are going. They're still in phase one and phase two. Uh, very briefly, a 16 and an 18 year old and probably a 14, although no one has said that officially, behaves physiologically pretty much like an adult. But a four year old and an eight year old and a 10 year old don't, and certainly a neonate and a baby don't. And so all those studies have to be redone before this vaccine will be approved for pediatrics. It's gonna be a while. I think probably at least a year. If you're newly pregnant, meaning you just found out, do you, feel, do you still feel the same way regarding the vaccine and pregnancy? I'm currently scheduled to receive my first dose and I'm still hesitant. In my first yeah. pregnancy, I had gestational diabetes. Yeah, I, I can tell you, um, and I, you know, I don't like to share family stories um, with the world, but um, yes, and one of my closest relatives is in the same situation and fortunately just got the first dose of the vaccine this week. So I am an advocate of giving it to pregnant women. Um, I know there's hesitancy. I know there's no studies. I view this the way I think you need to view it is comparative efficacy and risks. That's the way you need to view this 
this vaccine, in my opinion, for the people who are vaccine hesitant. What do I mean? I mean, look, everything you do carries risks, okay? I have said that six people a year in the United States die of poisonous spiders. Um, eight people worldwide die of shark bites. Every time I go into the water, into the ocean, I'm looking for one of those fins sticking up after I've seen Jaws 20 years ago. But in reality, there's virtually no chance I'm gonna get bit by a shark in shallow water in our areas. Yet, 38,000 people die of auto accidents and 25 people die of lightning exposures. What about the COVID vaccine? 10 million people have gotten the vaccine, not one single death. Five people have died of anaphylaxis in the last 10 years from vaccines. Why is that? Because people are able to treat anaphylaxis, which is readily reversible when you have an EpiPen and you're able to treat it. That's the way I view pregnancy too. I view what is my risk of getting COVID and dying of COVID from pregnancy while I'm pregnant and interrupting my family versus a theoretical risk from the shot. And that's the way I think you have to view these decisions. If COVID wasn't all over the place, if COVID wasn't killing 4,000 people a day, then the decision would be, be careful. I wouldn't give it to you know my closest relatives if they were pregnant because there's just not a lot of data out yet. And it took a long time before we were comfortable giving influenza vaccine in pregnancy, which we now do routinely. And it took a long time till we were comfortable giving the DTaP in the last trimester of pregnancy, which everybody gets now, or if, you know, and sort of their relatives. So I, I think, you know, you have to view it in view of relative risks and the time we're living in, there is so much COVID. And yes, the death rates are much, much higher in the elderly, much higher. But COVID is still the third most common cause of death now in the United States. And I have seen a 19 year old die of COVID who was previously healthy. Is the amount of nasal carriage lower in vaccinated patients? Don't know the answer to that. I suspect so, but that's why you still need to wear a mask after you've gotten the vaccine. No one knows whether you could have asymptomatic spread basically because it wasn't looked for in the trials. It just wasn't practical to start culturing 40,000 people in these trials on a weekly basis uh, for COVID. So I, I don't know the answer. After getting the vaccine, how long is it good for? Don't know the answer to that either. As I said, at least eight months. I'm hoping it's years, but I don't know the answer yet. We have a cohort of patients who repeatedly test negative, but clinically have COVID. Is this related to mutation changes in the virus or is it related to the test itself or technique? It's probably related to the test. So far, none of the variants are unable to be picked up by our currently available PCRs. So even if you come in and you get you know, infected with the British uh, strain 117, it will be picked up by our PCR. If there is a dramatic mutation in this virus, then new PCRs will need to be um, brought out, but that's not the case. If you have somebody with COVID, you know, and they have negative tests, that happens. I mean, I saw somebody who had five negative tests. We were sure the patient had COVID, and after the patient was finally bronched, had a positive COVID test. So you need to just use your judgment under those circumstances. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is yet to be approved, is a single dose. How is it different from the two that are currently available? It's dramatically different. It's a viral vector vaccine. The technology and the platform are completely different. It's similar, but with a different adenovirus to the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is licensed and approved in Europe. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine will probably be, um, the, the code will probably be broken by the end of January, probably in two to three weeks. And I suspect that um, it will be on the market within you know, weeks of that. Um, unfortunately, as I read yesterday in the paper, the original um, claims that, that Johnson & Johnson made are not true, that they would be able to produce up to 100 million doses per month. It now looks like it is a small fraction of those. The vaccine appears to be very good. It is much more user-friendly to use. It can sit in refrigerators for months. It doesn't need this cold storage line. You don't have to throw it away after you puncture the vial in six hours. It's the perfect vaccine for physicians' offices and other centers where, where they have a lower volume. You don't have to use 10 doses in six hours, which is what would have to happen with Moderna. Um, so I think it's gonna be an improvement and a great help. 
unfortunately, I don't think we're going to get the relief we need based on the numbers. What about any long-term effects? Don't know yet. The trial hasn't even been broken. Um, they do use the same primers. So again, all of these vaccines are all directed against the same antibody. They have different delivery systems, but basically they are all going for the same spike A protein set um, of uh, protein. And even the Norvax, I don't know if any of you have gotten that, but that is in trials on Long Island. I know a number of people who have participated in that. That looks like also a great vaccine looks very safe, is the only vaccine that I think will be able to be used in people who are highly allergic to the current vaccines um, because the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has polysorbate in it. So it's not gonna be your salvation if you had anaphylaxis to the uh, one other one. Um, but that vaccine is still in trials. What about any long-term effects? Um, from the Johnson & Johnson trial, you know, again, it's, it's the study hasn't even been concluded. So I would be um, less than um, candid if I knew the answer to that. After I get two doses of vaccine, can I still transmit COVID to others? That's the um, same question as to whether I can excrete COVID in the nasal passages. And the answer is we do not know. Um, and that's why you need to continue to wear the mask. Is it safe for seniors with COPD and emphysema to get the vaccination? Yes, all the more reason. That's why they're in the high-risk group. That's why they should be prioritized. Can you start experiencing the side effects to the second dose of the vaccine four days later? If yes, how long could we expect the ex to experience side effects? Yeah, if you have no side effects, it's very unlikely you're going to start getting side effects by day four. Certainly, they can last till day four. I've seen a few that go out to day five. Um, not longer than that. I'm not aware of any that have gone out longer. I, I don't know whether there have been some of those cases. Um, if somebody gets nothing until day four, I would be cautious in making a diagnosis that it's related to the vaccine. Remember, other things happen to people all the time, particularly when you're vaccinating 11 million people. With respect to immunocompromised people, has there been any large scale testing that include children or younger teenagers, particularly efficacy and safety? No. Uh, additionally, are there any immunosuppressed conditions that have priority? Yes, uh, soon in New York, um, as of I think today, as soon as the definitions of immune suppression have been worked out with the state, they will be a, a group um, with a high priority. and. That's a difficult thing to do. As I say, you know, the reality is um, people have basal cell carcinomas removed. They have cancer. They're not immunosuppressed. Other people don't have cancer, but are immunosuppressed. So it's a very large, large group of people. And I don't think we're going to be able to seriously check on people and ask for documentation. Can you still get COVID even though you are vaccinated? Yes, until the vaccine kicks in, which is for the Pfizer vaccine a week after the second dose, the Moderna vaccine even longer, two weeks after the second dose. Uh, I've seen many people get COVID three days after the vaccines. That has happened repeatedly. Are there any concerns of being around an infant after getting the vaccine, not breastfeeding? No, no concerns at all. We have been told to take the vaccine even if you have had COVID and now have the antibodies. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I think the immunity from the vaccine will be um, reinforce your own immunity. I think the vaccine may produce better immunity than the, um, than the natural infection itself. Um, Dr. Fauci has recommended waiting 90 days if you've had COVID, um, basically not because you're gonna get hurt by the vaccine, but just because people need it more than you. Is a shellfish allergy a concern for the vaccine? None at all. Is it safe if you have multiple myeloma? Yes, you're immunosuppressed. If you had the first vaccine and then contracted COVID, can you get the second vaccine? Yeah, you just need to wait 10 days out so that you're not contagious when you come in. Can you receive the vaccine if you are actively sick with COVID-19? And how long should you wait if you were sick with COVID and received treatment? No, you should not get it if you're actively sick. You should recover and there's no need. And certainly we don't want people with COVID coming in to a pod to get the vaccine. And I don't think there's any urgency. So you should fully recover 
Um, and as I said, it might be prudent to wait 90 days. Um, Sorry if you covered this, but can you talk about the vaccine with breastfeeding? Yeah, I have no qualms about it. Any idea when the vaccine may be available at local pharmacies like CVS and Walgreens? I wish I knew the answer to that. I think it's gonna be difficult for the Pfizer vaccine to be given at CVS and Walgreens. Um, certainly the Johnson & Johnson would be the great one. Moderna, certainly it can be done, but um, I don't know. At the present time, that is, that is um, there's not enough vaccine. The pods are up and the pods don't have enough vaccine. So the reality is I don't know the answer to that question. How long will somebody have antibodies once they've had COVID-19? They fade in a lot of people. Some people, they last a while, but in other people, they fade usually at six months or a little longer, not in everybody. Um, and we don't really know what that means because there's a lot of people who have immunity to things where their antibodies fade, but when they're exposed to the pathogen, they quickly make what's called an amnistic response. Amnistic meaning a memory response. So remember, don't think of this vaccine's immunity as being totally related to antibodies, because it's not. If you notice in the Pfizer trials, people were partially protected way before they even made antibody. And that's most likely from cell-mediated immunity that we don't have easy commercial tests available to measure. Is there a concern with the vaccine if you have a severe latex allergy? No, there's no latex in the, um, the punctured uh, caps to the uh, vials. So if there was latex in them and you used a syringe to puncture the vials, then uh, trace amounts of latex could get in your vaccine by going through that top of the vial. But there is no latex in that vial. Um, and so there's no issue of latex allergy. Are there strains of COVID that test negative with the PCR test? Not at the present time. That's something to watch for, but not at the present time. There are patients who have all the symptoms and findings and test repeatedly negative. Do we treat them as COVID? Often we do. Uh, that's a judgment call by the clinicians taking care of the patients, but yes, that has certainly happened. Is the vaccine recommended for children with autism? It's not recommended for any children. So uh, the answer is no, it's, it's not recommended for children and can't be given to children. The World Health Organization does not recommend the vaccine for pregnancy. Why do they not? Is the, uh, what is the statistic of pregnant women and fetus being harmed from COVID? There is no statistics. This has not been studied. There's a registry that's been set up, but as I indicated before, there are no trials in pregnancy that are up and running. Um, so you, that's an individual choice. I favor it, but uh, no one's forcing a pregnant women, obviously, to get vaccinated. It's entirely up to them. Um, I don't know why the World Health Organization has made that determination or not. They're a different group and not to besmirch them in any way, but their audience and their agenda is a little bit different in that they are very, very much at the present time gearing their efforts and probably rightfully so to the tremendous lack of vaccination available in third world countries. And they don't want to dilute that effort at all by giving it to people where um, they don't think it's as necessary as it is. And um, there are large numbers of countries where not a single person has been vaccinated yet in the third world. Can you be a carrier of COVID if you are exposed after getting the vaccine? Uh, that's again, the same question that was asked before, which is in theory, yes. Practically speaking, I doubt it. But again, I don't know the answer to that. Can you still transmit COVID after the second dose of the vaccine? Same answer. I mean, in theory, if you're an asymptomatic carrier, it's possible. We don't know. How can you schedule for vaccine appointments if you're an outside patient and not an employee? You got to go to the websites. You got to fight. You got to keep looking. You got to go to the state websites, the county websites. You got to go to the Northwell websites. You know, the New York City websites won't take you um, unless you're a resident. Do the state websites are being set up. They're large. They will certainly get vaccine. There's one being set up at Jones Beach. Um, it's going to be a very large site. Um, it's, it's hit or miss now. That's why I said it's somewhat like a lottery. 
Is it true that the hospital has run out of vaccines and is unable to provide the second dose for those who already had the first dose? No, they, they are always running out of vaccine, but they're always getting more shipments. And so far there's guarantees that everyone will get their second dose. What about patients on immunosuppressive agents? They were excluded from trials? They were. There was no, uh, they were excluded from trials. And so we don't know the long-term efficacy in that group. We do know they're safe in that group, which is why they're a priority group. Is the vaccine still effective if the second dose is delayed due to limited supply? Um, the answer is how long is it delayed? No one really thinks that it's important that it be given on that day. There's a grace period of 96 hours each way. And I don't think there'd be any problem if you're two weeks late or three weeks late. Um, I wouldn't try the experiment that they're doing in the UK, which is they're giving everyone one dose and then hoping they get vaccinated. It may not be till six months. I think that that's uh, a very risky strategy and not one that I would support. So, you know, if you're three weeks late, no problem. If you're gonna do it six months later, I think that's a mistake. If you get COVID after the first vaccine and still have COVID when the second vaccine is due, would you have to restart the vaccine or still take the second dose? You take the second dose, just once you're not contagious. When will the vaccine invites be sent out to new employees that started in Northwell in December? Uh, well, that's a good question. I. Um, I think everybody's been invited. So I think they just have to go and register. There are no, there are no groups in our health system that have not been invited. So um, I'm not sure if they're gonna get at web, uh, formal invitations. I can find that out, but they're entitled to the vaccine and can make appointments. Is a pregnant spouse in her third trimester eligible and a high priority? No. Will Northwell continue to do the antibody testing for those who have them? You're welcome to do the antibody testing, yes. I'm not sure what it's going to influence at the present time, but yes. Is the vaccine safe for someone with Alzheimer's? Yes, that's the group in the nursing homes. Um, COVID is the second most common cause of death in people over the age of 85. Almost, what? 35, 40-ish percent of all deaths originally, it's changed a little, have occurred in um, nursing home residents. A lot of patients ask about using Ivectrum, of, of Ivermectin, sorry, I put you that. Ivermectin, Ivermectin because they have read it is effective on the internet. How do you handle these patients? I don't give it. I think you can read anything on the internet, as you well know. Be very careful about getting medical advice on the internet, reading about vaccine side effects, reading about somebody's experience. Please stick to the data. And you know there is a CDC website that you can go on after you've gotten your vaccine. Um, it's given to you with the information sheet and you can register any side effect that you think you had or a physician diagnosis with you. And that data is all being collated to look for whether there are really trends but not everything that happens after the vaccine is related to the vaccine. I urge you to look at the trials and see how many people had side effects from getting a saline shot during the vaccine trials who got the placebo. They got fever, they got nausea, they got headache, they got malaise too. Not nearly at the same rate, obviously, as those that got the vaccine and those side effects are very real, but that's why placebo controlled trials are so important. Some government officials have mentioned only giving one dose. Will Northwell continue to vaccinate our employees with both doses? Yes. Is it known if children are carriers yet and what age ranges? Yes, children can certainly carry the virus. Not commonly, but yes, they certainly can. There's no question about that. As you know, the good news has been that, you know, young children are a remarkably uncommon source of major spreader events, which is why elementary schools have been remarkably safe for the most part. Um, as they get to be teenagers, that dynamic changes enormously. And so a young child is not the same as a teenager, both in terms of their behavior, which I don't think I have to tell anybody, but also in terms of their physiology. Um, and so uh, th that is a so totally separate group. Are quantum dot tags in the vaccines? quantum dot tags. I'm not sure, honestly, what that is. Um, my husband is a 70-year-old with COPD and is on oxygen 24-7. He will be, will, will he be considered a patient of priority? Yes. 
he is a priority now. He is entitled to it and should get it. And as soon as he can schedule that visit, he should get it. Yes. How will out-of-state employees receive the vaccine from Northwell? If, if they work in Northwell, then you know they have to get both of their shots at Northwell or both of their shots in their home residence. You cannot give one dose, a follow-up dose, if you have not gotten the first dose at either that facility or a relative of that facility. So you will be able to go to another Northwell facility to get your second dose, but you can't get the first dose in New Jersey. This comes up all the time with people in Florida. And maybe someday the governor will change that, but if you get your first dose in Florida, you better stay in Florida to get your second dose. This isn't a question, but in regard to new employees, uh, you should contact Employee Health Services IT service and, the, and ask them for an invitation. They'll be able to get you an invitation for this. What do you recommend an out-of-state employee does in order to receive the vaccine? Well, I like I said, if they we've had this problem with people who live in Connecticut and work at Northwell and same with New Jersey, and they got to basically commit and so if you live in Connecticut, you can get both vaccines at Northwell, but you're gonna have a trouble if you try to go to a state site. So if you go to a state site, you better go to a Connecticut state site. When are you considered no longer contagious? 10 days after symptoms or a negative test? Uh, 10 days after symptoms or two negative tests if it's before 10 days and no fever for 24 hours. Okay, and our last question, does the vaccine prevent you from transmitting COVID or does it only help with severity of symptoms once you get COVID? Once again, we do not know the definitive answer. I think you're much less likely, much, much less likely, but is it theoretically possible? Yes. All right, Mr. Roberts, go ahead and wrap us up. Uh, Bruce, could you talk about the um, lingering symptoms of COVID-19 for six months or longer after recovery and uh, help our employees who are on the fence about getting a vaccine once again to get vaccinated? Yeah, of course. Um, so as you point out, you know, most young people do very well with COVID. Not all of them, by the way, but most of them. But um, as you point out, there are a subgroup that cuts across all ages, including younger people who have chronic lingering symptoms that seem to just last for a long time. We also have a group that, that gets seriously ill and seems to have significant pulmonary disease that lasts for a long time and we don't even know whether it is permanent or not. And these symptoms are really difficult to manage. Some people use steroids, some people just use nothing because there is no therapy for it. And it's another reason why you should not think to yourself, I'm young, I'm healthy, the worst that I'll do is get COVID because the worst that can happen is you get COVID and either die from it or have a lingering ongoing series of almost um, chronic fatigue-like symptoms that are real. So I wanna have a big uh, thank you to Dr. Bruce Farber, uh, who has been our guest today. Uh, he's a very busy guy, as you could uh, imagine. Uh, we definitely thank you for coming on today. Our 15 minute check-in has gone uh, you know, over, uh, over uh, 40 minutes. Uh, and I wanna thank everybody for asking the questions and, uh, you know, uh, any last uh, final uh, words of wisdom, uh, Dr. Farber? No, please get vaccinated. I mean, I've done it for myself, I've done it for my family that are, that are eligible, and it is such the right decision. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Thank and you thank for you, having me. And thank everybody for uh, signing on. Uh, we've had over 300 people uh, listen to Dr. Farber. Uh, thank you very much. We'll see you or uh, you'll, you'll see us next week. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. This seminar is for educational purposes only. It is not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Consult with your medical provider for medical advice or treatment. Although the presenters try to keep the information in this seminar as accurate and timely as possible, the speakers and Mather Hospital assume no duty to ensure the seminar is error-free. The speakers and Mather Hospital are not responsible or liable for any claim, loss, or damage resulting from you viewing this seminar.